डॉक्टर बलविंदर पिकअप फोन नो करके सीरीज because shantruta when i was talking with him that we are starting this real life surgical video technique series on ortho tv he told her let's start with foot and ankle and he took upper hand and he has organized the meeting with dr mahender the president of indian foot and ankle society so welcome shantruta our secretary of indian foot and ankle society over to you for introduction of faculty hi thank you so much dr rajiv you are the live wire of this uh, webinar and we are very thankful to all our faculty first of all i'll welcome the new president of indian foot and ankle society my elder brother dr mahendra kuchatkar from goa thank you for joining sir and uh, next i'll welcome all my uh, very revered colleagues and uh, speakers of this session dr rajesh simon the past secretary of ifas from kochi kerala dr sr sundar rajan past president of ifas from ganga hospital kamchor we have uh, two more presenters who will be joining us later one is dr balvinder rana uh, past president of ifas he'll be joining later and then dr sampat dumra patel again the past secretary and past president of ifas will be joining as well so it's going to be a action filled evening today where all these masters will present their videos in surgical techniques so to start the ball rolling may i call dr rajesh simon after the comments from dr mahendra sir so mahendra sir then dr rajesh simon sir yeah thank you santanu for the kind words uh, i think it's going to be a fantastic uh, one half hour of academic learning because uh, for a surgeon there is nothing better than looking at the surgical techniques and uh, i think what the only thing we are going to do is we're going to allow dr rajesh simon to start first because uh, just changing the batting order because you know we want to start it with a big bang so rajesh uh, you, you can forward your uh, open your presentation and go ahead thank you president and secretary and uh, let me start uh, without much ado so i hope i am visible and uh, yes you're right you're on go ahead all right yeah so uh, my topic on today is the subtalar fusion and my video is on the subtalar distraction subtalar fusion so uh, a word about subtalar arthrodesis is why do we do arthrodesis is most commonly is mostly the post traumatic the fracture malunited calcaneum other uh, other reasons we do is the post polio or arthritis very rarely but more commonly is the post traumatic and the flat foot part of flat foot tarsal coalitions and other causes are rheumatoid arthritis and neuromuscular disorders so these are the reasons we do uh, this thing but most common as i said is the post traumatic uh, arthritis of especially after the fracture calcaneum patient usually presents with pain over the lateral side of the foot and inability to walk in uneven ground if you look carefully there will be deformities of the heel set tender sinus tarsi and uh, this is how if you look at it the, the the heel would be broadened and a little bit deformity in the subtalar area the alignment you have to look at the alignment of the uh, the hind foot the arches the bony prominence the heel width and height the status of the neurovascular structures as well as the tight ta uh, is something which we have to look now as you all know the foot is a foundation of the body and so when the foot is affected the rest of the proximal part is also affected so the knee hip si joint spine all should be examined when you look at the x rays you have to look at the bowler's angles the heel width height bony prominence 
So you've got to plan out your surgery. If at all, you want to do something extra along with your subtalar arthrodesis like exhaustomy. Uh, and uh, CT always is helpful to understand the pathoanatomy of the subtalar region. The position of the arthrodesis whenever you plan is zero to five degrees of ankle valgus. Uh, the, the TN and CC joint should be neutral and the forefoot should be plantigrade. When, when this is the position you want the, the, when you are sub, you're fusing your subtalar joint. So you can do subtalar joint with, uh, with in C2 if you have no deformities, distraction if you have loss of height, especially with that we see in the fracture calcaneum or with osteotomy uh, if you're planning to do, I mean, in, on, on a patient who's got flat feet, so you have an associated deformity then you do an osteotomy along with it. So here we are talking about a post-traumatic uh, patient with, uh, uh, with the loss of height and widening. So you can see the height is lost um, here. So sorry, uh, the height is lost. There is uh, the width is increased. This is a classical picture of a post-traumatic calcaneal, malunited calcaneal injury. Uh, and uh, the, where the subtalar arthritis is the main cause in the patient. Because of this widening, there is a subfibular impingement because uh, of that. And that is one reason uh, um, the, 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 uh, the patient got, gets this lateral pain. Lateral sub, uh, subfibular impingement leads to the lateral pain. And that is one of the main causes where the patient comes to you. So you got to look at the two reasons of what uh, the pain is. So here it was a loss of uh, the height as well as the subfibular impingement was the cause. So I did I took an extensile lateral approach. Now in this, when you're doing an extensile lateral approach, unlike the fresh calcaneal fracture, you don't have to worry much about the soft tissue because there's no active swelling, like so then you don't have to wait for the wrinkle sign, etc. But the principle of opening the fracture is the same. You go directly to the bone and from the apex, you go um, and elevate the flap. So the same principle, because you want to uh, take care of the, 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 uh, the flap and that is how you raise the flap from the elbow, um, from the calcaneum. And now you, when you look at the flap, you can see the elevated calcaneum, the, the malunited calcaneum. You can see the exhaustomy here. I'm trying to open up the subtalar joint, which is not much moving and cannot be seen because of the lateral bump. That picture is of the CFL, which has been torn by the injury. And now my probe, if you can see, how big an exhaustomy is in the lateral side. And that was that is the bump which actually was impinging on the subfibular region. So the proximally would be the subfibular region. So after putting with a no tip touch technique by retracting the flap with the K wires in the three different zone, like what we do in a normal fracture calcaneum. And this is how you do, you do an exhaustomy because you want to remove the subfibular impingement initially. So take off the bump uh, and this bone is helpful as a graft later on. So you don't throw off the bone, you remove the bump completely. You can check with your CM if you have removed the bump completely. And um, now once you have taken off in this is how much you take off is in, in level with the subtalar area of, of the tailor's area approximately. And now I'm curating out the remnants of the cartilage of the car, subtalar joint. And now you can see I've cleared up all the subtalar area. This is especially the posterior facet. So here uh, I've uh, got it distracted. And then I'm in, introducing, this is the allograft which I took, uh, we, which we had. So this allograft is measured and then kept in at the posterior facet. And the re remaining of this is to create a height. So this is the distraction. So you regain the lost height of uh, how much uh, the, that had collapsed during the fracture. And uh, now, the, uh, now you can uh, check up with the C arm picture and the remaining of the gap is filled by the exhaustomy bone. And that is how 
it looks like a good prestige and looks completely filled tech with the cm and then uh, uh, stabilize this with the, the two screws which we normally put for the arthrodesis so here i'm putting a cannulated screw and that's how the uh, the, the the two wires would look like and then uh, inserting the screw here and that is how this the the the, the x-ray uh, the the final thing is and then the closure of the flap since it was a graft put, I put it from um, the drain there. And uh, this is how the suit of the, the, the post-op picture is. And this is how the, go, the arthrodesis goes on to heal well. Uh, so thank you very much for that uh, listening. Yeah, thank you so much. It was a wonderful presentation, uh, Dr. Simon. A uh, few questions for the benefit of the listeners. So in this case, you have uh, used the extensile lateral approach, right? Yes. So is that the approach you take uh, most of the time or you do different? Uh, uh, so it depends upon what is the reason of uh, exhaust uh, subtalar arthrodesis. For example, if you this, we had a large exhaustomy lateral incident. <coughs> so I had to take off that lateral wall, which was a big one. If it is not uh, lateral or wall, you don't need to take it out. It is just in situ. Then even you can do just use the posterior limb of the extensile lateral approach and just use that. If you have no other problem, it is just uh, arthroscopic, uh, I mean, just uh, fusion. You can yeah, I have done uh, arthroscopic subtalar fusion also. It's a little difficult. You need a learning curve in doing an arthroscopic subtalar joint because you got to get into that posterior facet. But these are the different ways to uh, you know, do the same thing of arthrodesis. So what is the reason? Why are we doing it? Depending upon that. Extensile lateral approach gives a complete open book. And especially when you have a large exhaustomy in the lateral aspect and you want to remove it, this helps as as a bone graft also. So Rajesh, I have two questions for you. Yeah. One is when you're opening up the subtalar joint, do you use um, any particular device to distract that joint? Do you, in, like, is there a hinterman or do you yes, use so, a so laminar spreader? This one was quite a lax one. So I, I mean, I actually, I, for the picture, I took off the uh, laminar spreader. Yeah, you, you saw the same term, yeah. So yeah, if you so have a problem, you could use a hinterman. Laminar. Now, normally, you need a lambda spreader and then you grid it out and then see how much distraction you put. Put a K wire to hold this in place and so that you know exactly how much you want. And then you measure the graft, of, or you can take either a tricortical graft and then uh, you know, insert it after removing the K wire. So, this is, uh, I had done that, which is not there in that video, but this is how you normally do. The second uh, question is, uh, when you are positioning your uh, screws, what is the right direction, whether it is convergent, divergent, or parallel? What is the best construct that you would use to, you know, stabilize that? Or you... Normally, uh, uh, so so if you look at calcaneum, calcaneum is little valgus to the tibia, I mean, to the, uh, the plane. But uh, so you go from little, uh, you start usually uh, live one, the lateral goes to the, I go a little divergent, though in this it is uh, more parallel, but I prefer to do more uh, div a little bit of a divergent uh, screws, one in the posterior facet and one towards the middle facet. Okay. Right. So, yeah, Sundar uh, wants to ask. Sundar. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Rajesh, I think uh, another comment is also, I mean, when you do the distraction arthrodesis, I think the hinterman Retractor is very, very useful because uh, you're going to insert a big uh, tricortical graft. And uh, yes. most often, I mean, I use all the time uh, Hinterman uh, retraction for my distraction arthrodesis because it's very much useful. Because yes. when you have a tricortical graft of uh, 8 mm, 9 mm, 10 mm, it will not uh, go very easily. It is very tough to, you have to just keep it up and bank it inside so that it sits nicely too. Yes. So, so. And, uh, uh, my question is, uh, like, how do you decide uh, between your, you know, in situ arthrodesis and uh, uh, distraction arthrodesis? What are the radiological parameters you do? How do you measure? I mean, 
your way of doing so so, uh, so the basic uh, whole pl plan is pre op planning uh, you you that is what are my my x ray which the axial view is very important here uh, especially when you're talking about uh, now the cause why are we doing this subtalar arthrodis so this actually comes more in a post traumatic uh, arthrodis wherein you have the calcaneum height is shortened it is wider and that is where you got to do the distraction arthrodis so if you are doing an arthrodis for other causes like flat foot and all you don't have the length you don't bother about the length or the width so you don't bother about all that only during the 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 uh, the post traumatic arthritis the height and the width is there so always help the help is or the guide is the opposite side the normal side x ray normal side x ray is the one which actually guides you how much of width you want to have and how much of height you want to distract and that is what you uh, decide on um, uh, on how much uh, yeah. width and height yeah that is very important point so whenever you decide for this especially distraction arthrodis is we need an opposite uh, halkal calcaneal lateral view to see for the parallel pitch line and the calcaneal height to be measured then you can compare with the normal side and we can measure how much uh, height you required for your distraction arthrodesis and we can calculate for the tricortical graft so that will be useful for the uh, audiences that's why i asked this question adesh um, what is your post op uh, protocol for this patient so the post op protocol yeah. is uh, uh, since in this particular case was a extensile lateral approach i did put uh, him on a uh, posterior splint for 3 weeks it depends if i do an arthroscopic arthrodesis i do it only for 2 weeks and start mobilizing the ankle uh, so in this one i wanted to keep the soft tissue safeguarded for 3 weeks then i started no, uh, ankle mobilization but continued non weight bearing till almost i think here i waited for 8 weeks because i was not convinced about the the because of the huge cortical graft uh, tricortical graft it takes time to incorporate so the the weight bearing is lit was little delayed in situ fixation my weight bearing starts at 6 weeks right so i had four five questions Ajib. yeah rajiv yeah so very good video uh, dr rajesh and uh, there are some debates in number of screw how many screw do you want to put two or three for stabilizing the subtalar joint and so if you look at the, if you ask the uk guys they even say one screw is enough but most often we do two screws uh most of the guys around the world use two screws now there are people who put anterior screws towards the anterior facet i don't uh, i think i've done good number of subtalar which i never have used uh, subtalar anterior screws it is usually two screws little divergent one posterior and one towards the middle facet and then i'm happy about so reports have suggested that there is no difference whether you put a anterior or posterior screw but yes. putting a single screw the incidence of non union and things can be high because you can't hold the rotation in one screw you yeah, have to have minimum two screws third screw is optional one screw yes i think dr sundar told about hinderman retractor so i just i remember hinderman usually he used headless screw for compression and suggested that compression is more with headless screw so what is your suggestion on that it's like that uh, so if you looked at my x rays the one which i showed you here is a headless screw the 6.5 headless screw uh, this is what i used here but uh, the, then again it is a it's a debate um headless screw versus uh, head screws the problem uh, the the compression which you get with head is little more larger which will lighter but uh, the, the the there is a impingement issues with the head um but uh, there are proponents and uh, uh, those who are against also for the, the screws with head and all i prefer to use headless screws if my position is right if my position is little posterior and then i prefer headless screws because the soft tissue impingement is uh, is much less but then if you ask different people there um, that, that is a debate the pro yeah. proponents for either ones are there yeah, no, i use with uh, head i mean with the head only i have not yeah. used the headless screws somehow i not used it 
Yeah, they say, I just said, I think there is no big issue between using a head uh, without head. The question is, only things when you're using the, what is important is you have to use a short threaded screw and make yeah. sure that it's crossing the joint and uh, compressing the joint very well. The other point is maybe the, when you use the head screws, you should not go too distal and plantar, plantar onwards. Then yes. there's a possibility that can come with the impeachment pain, like what Rajesh mentioned. Even I had to remove one or two cases like that for the pain in the future. So if you have, if you keep it away from the plantar side, plantar skin, and it doesn't weight bear much, then I don't think it's a big issue with the head screws. I think the, at the end of the day in orthopedics, it's the principle that matters. How you do and what implant you do is, is, is secondary. Yes. So there are four or five questions for the benefit of my audience. I'll ask you. One is, what kind of a screw would you use in such a case? Because you have put a bone graft. So, and it's a distraction with interposition of the bone graft. So would you use a position screw or a compression screw? Would you use a fully threaded screw here? So both the screws fully threaded or one is screw for compression, one for holding the position. So what is the best combination for you? That is my question number one. So I would prefer to use this as a as a as a um, compression screw because it is an interposition of graph, big graph. So I won't have a, a universal compression. So uh, if if it is not much of a big graft, then I think one screw uh, compression screw and one uh, fully threaded screw might help. But most of the time, I I, I put a compression screw. Right, right. So because I want universal compression. Right. Second question, many of the uh, people who are just starting this procedure would be a little uh, worried about how medially they have to go. They also would be worried about the medial neurovascular structure. So how do you ensure that you go correct length medially? What is your medial extent and how do you ensure that you do not injure the neurovascular structure and you do enough medially as well? So what is your extent? So uh, the, the, that is where you, when you put your K wires, when you're putting your arth screw, when you put your K wires, you look at the axial and the lateral. Those are the two, uh, two views, it is must. So the axial will help you to, uh, you're not going medially. So axial X-ray is the one when, so you just go one cortex and look at both on lateral and axial view. You can never be an expert. However see, uh, experienced you are, you have to um, see the axial view and the lateral view. Uh, and then it helps faster. Any, any guidance from the FHL tendon? FHL tendon is too posteriorly. I don't think it'll come in. You to visualize that generally. No. No, it, it's too posterior. Right. Another question is, what is the correct age and after how much time it will go for this because for example today i had two cases one of my patient who had a malunion calcaneus he is just 17 and another patient who came in the second follow up he was 22 and there are patients who are 60 so what is your uh, does age matter to take on that it is a quality of life that matters it is not the age so uh, the, the quality of life, it is affected. See, the, don't treat the x-rays. The x-rays might be bad. There might be some teller arthritis in the x-ray, but the patient will not feel pain. Don't touch them. If the patient is asking for, in foot and ankle, we always say it is treat the patient, examine the patient, and if there is tenderness in subtalar joint, if the patient is complaining that he cannot walk in an uneven surface, if he's a worker, he cannot climb stairs or ladders, uh, then uh, that is a necessity for subtalar arthritis. And, and, and x-ray shows subtalar arthritis, then that is a necessity. Age usually doesn't matter. It is a quality of life that matters. Right. Thank you so much. Any more question from any of the faculties or uh, monitors? I think we have one question on the chat box. So okay. sometime when you are exposing the uh, extensive digital brevis, well, would you like to split it or would you like to take a flap of it to expose the subtalar joint? Digital brevis. Yeah. Um, why should extensor digital? You, you don't need to go that far. 
you don't you need to go are, that far. You don't need to go that far. You are doing an extensive lateral approach and you don't uh, see anything. You are just yeah. directly onto the bone and you take the flap completely. You don't come into uh, other than the uh, so, uh, I think that is for the question. Is the, I think he was asking for sinus tarsi approach. I think that was no, no, that no, 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 sir. Yeah, if you want to do the lateral, I mean, sinus tarsi, extended sinus tarsi approach, if you want to go for a calcaneal keep a joint, if you go more uh, anteriorly, tarsal side, Anterior. more tarsal, then you extend the digital arm comes the first structure. Most of you retract it. Yes, it's better yeah. to retract. Yes. So, uh, so uh, do we move on to the next presentation? Yes. Dr. Anup has joined. Dr. Shantanuta, let's introduce yeah, Dr. Anup. Yeah. 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 Sure. Sure. That's what I was going to do. My senior, my teacher, my friend, my philosopher and guide, Dr. Anup. Dr. Anup Agrawal from Lucknow. Hi. It's, it's really a pleasure to have you, sir, here, and we are really grateful that you could make it finally. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shantanu, for unwarranted words. They were not required. And it's a really pleasure to join you all. Sorry for late. I just got stuck in some traffic. So I'm so sorry for being late. I missed your wonderful video, Rajesh. Uh, hope to see you again sometime. It is on YouTube. You can see it on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. see it on YouTube. Yeah. So, Shantanu, so we can go on. with our next talk. Okay. Yeah, moving on, may I request my good friend, the past president of IFAS from none other than Ganga Hospital, Dr. Ra Dr. S. R. Sundarajan, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, hope you can see my slide, Santanu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Okay. You can. I'll hear you well. Okay. So here is I'm starting with the case. He's an 18 years old female. She's a, a shuttle badminton player from Maldives. And she came with recurrent ankle instability for one and a half years because of the twisting injury which happened while playing in a tournament. And she has, uh, she continued to play with uh, some strain and pain. And uh, basically she was presenting with uh, recurrent instability uh, while playing badminton and uh, she couldn't continue the uh, professional career. On examination, she had a tenderness over the anterolateral joint and she had lax ankle with the anti test positive. And when he has, and also she had a dimpling of the skin and the lateral aspect of the passive inversion and virus of the foot. Of course, range of movements were full. So this is her X-ray. Basically, naturally, you know that X-ray is going to be normal. So whenever you're dealing with the chronic lateral ankle instability, MRI uh, may not give you the, all the positive finding. But in this case, if you see this uh, calcaneum fibular ligament, where you can see that fibula, this is a calcaneum, calcaneum fibular ligament is intact. And you can see this uh, uh, ATFL, that is the uh, tibia fibular, anterior tibia fibular ligament. Uh, here, it's here, structurally intact, but it's a bit lax. So many times uh, you can see that intact structural of ATFL, but the patient can have a uh, recurrent instability. So it doesn't, I mean, you don't have a mandatory uh, tear of ATFL complete uh, the retraction. So many times you have a lax ATFL, but patient can have a uh, recurrent instability. So the MRI can give you the clue and the, help you to diagnose, but it is not a mandatory to diagnose chronic lateral instability, especially for the surgical management. So what we are dealing with here is the chronic lateral ankle instability is one of the common source of ankle dysfunction in sports person. And most often what we see the anterior tail of fibular ligament injury alone, but it can be combined with the calcaneal fibular ligament injury. So basically what we are dealing is here is what you are seeing is the anterior talofibular ligament. This is a fibula and this is a talus, which you can see that. And calcaneal fibular ligament, we can see another broad band. You can see that it goes under the peroneal tendons. And th these are the both, uh, these both are giving the lateral stability for an ankle when you do an inversion. So most often the ATFL is torn. But as they say, that's the, 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 there can be an extension of the calcaneal fibular ligament to the anterior tail of fibular ligament. So sometimes it can tear the calcaneal fibular ligament too. Then the instability can be more than what you have with the pure ATFL. So the most common test is the anterior tail of fibular, uh, I mean, anterior dryer test, which you can 
uh, uh, able to demonstrate by holding the tibia and pushing the uh, pulling the uh, calcaneum anteriorly, which you can see that uh, dryer test. But when you have a CFL, even you can do an inversion. Uh, uh, you can just do an inversion that can give you a tilt of the talus. So talus tilt test will be positive. There is a both CFL also is lost, but most often anterior dryer test is positive. But sometimes uh, it is difficult to demonstrate clinically. But all the patients, when you do a surgical management, sorry, um, uh, you try to do the uh, arthroscopy too. Anyway, before you do decide for surgery, of course, we do a conservative management for all lateral instability, unless the patient comes with recurrent instability, in spite of lateral strengthening exercises and all the physiotherapy. Make sure that if you are doing surgical management, patient doesn't have any underlying deformity, especially like cavus foot or the varus heel or flat foot, then they have to be addressed. And also it's better to examine for gastroc tightness. So if it is there, then this can be combined with your enter, uh, 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 lateral stability surgery. Now another important point to examine for the chronic lateral instability is the generalized ligament laxity. So these patients, we have to be very careful because they need more stabilization than the normal patients. So this general, generalized ligament laxity should be examined. As I already told that the MRI specificity for ATFL is 100%, but CFL is 83%. But I can see that the sensitivity is low, 56% for ATFL and 50% for calcaneum fibular ligament. Of course, it's very important. MRI is also helpful to do know the osteochondral lesion. Anyway, you are going to do an arthroscopy, but if you have an MRI already, you know that what you are going to deal with, so you can explain the prognosis to the patients. So all the patients, even who do an open procedure, you can do an arthroscopy with any osteochondral lesion. You can deal it with the arthroscopy. Then you can proceed with the uh, open procedure. So coming to the surgical management, there are two ways of dealing with that, whether you can do a non-anatomical repair or reconstruction or anatomical repair or reconstruction. So I'm not going to talk about non-anatomical repair or reconstruction because most of us know that there are a lot of failures in non-anatomical repairs. So, uh, most of us, most of the surgeons don't do the non-anatomical procedure at all. So mostly we are concentrating on the anatomical repair or anatomical reconstruction or arthroscopic anatomical repair or reconstruction. What do you mean by repair? What do you do in repair means you do an anatomical direct repair with or without uh, including the inferior extensor or retinoculum. Anatomical reconstruction, whether you can do with allograft or autograft, or we can do with the same thing, you can do it arthroscopy. So basically, the direct repair is recommended if there is an adequate ligamentous remnants. That means you should have a good quality of the tissue to do a direct repair, whether to do a open or arthroscopy. But whenever you have a generalized ligamentous laxity, or there is a prior unsuccessful stabilization procedure, or poor or insufficient ligament remnants of high BMI, then you can do on a reconstruction so that can give you more uh, good results. So what we are talking about, so this is the diagrammatic representation of some procedures. What we call is a brostrum procedure is the direct repair of the ATFL and the CFL. You brostrum, hello. So a brostrum good procedure is what you are repairing with both repair and also you are reinforcing with inferior extensor retinoculum here. And uh, Carlson technique involving the proximal ligament ends of the drill. Well, we just directly do the drilling and take the ligaments attached. This is what we do most of them arthroscopically. But when you do an open procedure, you do a brastrum or brastrum good procedures. So basically, uh, I, in this case, I done an open brastrum good procedure. Of course, we do an arthroscopy and examine the joint, open up the joint, uh, especially in the lens field. When you relax, you can see the more opening over there. Uh, this is the syndesmosis. But many times, you can have some impingement and scarring over the anterior inferior tibia fibula ligament, what you are seeing in the white structure. Sometimes you may need to debridement in these cases. If it is there, then do remove all the scarring. Then we can uh, do an arthroscopy or open. So here that we are going to demonstrate open procedure. So here the incision is made just over the tip of the fibula. Here, because of the demonstration purpose, the incision is slightly longer than what we do normally. Here, what you are going to see is that this is the fibula and this is the talus which you are going to see. So this is the uh, ATFL is going to lie down. What you are seeing the white structure is, is the extensor retinoculum, inferior extensor retinoculum, which we are going to reinforce for your gold procedure. That is the, you can expose at the start or you can start expose later. So what is showing, this is the fibula, that is the talus, and what you are going to see here is the ATFL. 
though the ATF when you do an ATF, uh, here you are going to incise the, uh, sorry, before you go for exposing the ATF here, you are exposing the peroneal uh, sheath and uh, you guys, what you are seeing is the peroneal tendon. So it is also important to visualize that. So to see any peroneal tear, peroneus longus tear, which is one of the associated finding which you can find sometimes with the chronic lateral ankle instability. You can see that there is a peroneus brevis, which is the muscle. Other one is without muscle, that is the peroneus longus. So once the tendons are okay, then you can both you can uh, retract the, the both the tendons to look for the CFL. That is the calcaneal fibular ligament, whether it's intact or not. So your calcaneal fibular ligament lies underlying the underneath the peroneal uh, tendons. So here we are retracting the peroneal tendon and and using the curved artery forceps and using the retractor of the skin over here and trying to look for the CFL. So that is a very tight, broad structure. It will be easily, you can see the nice, taut, white structure over there. That is the CFL. So here the CFL is intact, which you can see the here nicely, which I'm maneuvering with the artery forceps. Then if it is fine, then you can leave it here. Then you come more dorsally. And this is the ATFL remnant of the lax ATFL, what you are seeing here. So normally what you do, then you incise and leave three to four mm of the ATFL attaching to the fibula over here. So you need an incision at least four mm distal to the distal fibula. Sometimes it is very difficult to differentiate your uh, ATFL tissue from the capsule. So we can leave the capsule and open the ATFL alone. Or sometimes the, AT, the capsule is very thin, it doesn't matter, then you can open the capsule tooth or you can net later on, you can do the reinforcement. So what you are doing, then you are leaving the three to four mm of the remnant tissue to the fibula. So that can be again, uh, slowly separated from the attachment. You can lift off as a flap. What, I, what you are seeing is, you can see the other view. You are seeing from the uh, foot side. So here, uh, uh, you can see that this is the tissue flap which are attached to the ATFL, to the distal end of the fibula. You can, you can see that that is a, tip of the fibula. So I just erase that uh, uh, attachment of the ATFL so that you can take the distal ATFL and bring it and attach to the distal fibula over here. So you make the bone incised and also make the bone bit rough. So make the biology and allow it to bleed so that this tissue goes and attach over there. So once you've done the elevation of the flap, so you can use uh, drill holes and attach these two directly, or like this, you can use an anchor. Here I'm using a double loaded uh, anchor, all inside anchor. So you have to use the minimum small size anchor. So the all inside anchor some will be very useful because most of the patients are very young, the bone can hold it very nicely. So you are having the four number two fiber wire over here. So, and I'm taking bites through the distal ATFL. You can, you can see the distal ATFL fibers. So I'm taking, going to take all the four. It is uh, uh, almost uh, maybe three to four mm in interval. All the four bites, I'm going to take it. You can see that all the four the fibers over there. Then you can bring it and attach to the fibula where you had already prepared. You can see there's a gap over here. So this is where the gap is going to get closed when you do the plantar position of the foot and slight aversion, which you can see in the foot position. So you can see that they're going to uh, zoom it out. You can see that there is a foot is in a plantigrade position and slight aversion. Should not do a too much aversion, then the ankle will become very tight. So uh, keeping it in that position, you approximate the distal ATFL to the distal fibula and do the knots. If you are using the same threads, you can use the even sliding knot and over that you can do the off knots. Or you can do a just simple knots that is more than sufficient and making at least a four uh, knots so that it doesn't slip through. You can see that I'm taking the uh, same uh, threads and uh, putting the all the half knots. So basically, this is the uh, your brostrum procedure where you directly repair the ligaments, or uh, you are you can uh, uh, like this. And I'm taking that another two fiber wires and doing the knot. Once you've done the knots over here, the good procedure is basically what is you can 
directly bring this uh, uh, inferior extensor retinaculum and attach to the uh, distal fibula. Or you can see that is the inferior extensor retinaculum. Or what we can do, I can, usually I takes bite through the inferior extensor retinaculum. And you have already 4mm flap of ATFL, which is already reflected in the distal fibula. So just I'm reinforcing this flap and making this a reinforcement for the primary repo for the ATFL. So this is the good procedure where you are in, you know, you can, you can see that inferior extensor, extensor retinaculum is coming and closing with the distal fibula. So first I take all the bites. Basically, I same. I, I almost I take uh, four bites so that it can cover the entire ATFL uh, uh, width. You can see that I'm doing the tightening. You can see the inferior extensor retinaculum is drawn towards to the towards the fibula and getting it attached. So do the knotting and keeping the foot in the same position because already you are done repair, so you don't want to go for an inversion, but still. Don't try to manipulate because sometimes the tissues are weak, it will become, it can break. So till you repair the inferior extensor retinaculum, maintaining the foot in the same position is very important. So especially when you have a slight lax joint, then the good, adding the glute procedure is more useful because it can give a more uh, stability. So once you have done all the knots, all the four knots here, we can see that I, I taken the four bites, so doing the four knots. Then you cut it with a knife because there are fiber wire which you cannot cut it with a scissor. You need a knife. And that is the final repair which you can see that uh, uh, very robust repair. You can uh, you can try to do an even inversion and see how much it is uh, tight you can here compared to the preoperatively. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, that was really a wonderful presentation. Your video was really very nicely demonstrating the whole procedure. So, any question, Mahendabhai? So, uh, what is, how do you protect this repair? Do you use a particular brace or, and then for how long do you protect it? So, uh, usually I give, give them the um, plaster cost for four weeks. I don't take it a chance. So, I give them at least four, four weeks of uh, plaster cost. But I tell them to walk after four weeks with the full weight bearing, then encouraging the movements, uh, the, both the ankle and also the subtalar movements. But I tell them to not to do a uh, walk on uh, uneven surfaces or uh, uh, protect the foot with the uh, cam boot for another four weeks time. But they will be walking on the cam boot, but they will do exercises by removing the cam boot of uh, uh, ankle movements and get uh, uh, subtalar movements. Then after two months, they'll do all the proper receptive exercises, like you, know, you do a standing on the tiptoes and uh, the, everything. So usually I tell them to go for, uh, I mean, if they want to, if the patient is a sports person, then they'll be allowed to do only after uh, five to six months time. Right. So what are the complications that you have, uh, if at all, you have encountered after the surgery? The complications. In the, in the open brostrum, usually you don't get any complication unless uh, sometimes if the incision goes more posterior, you can encounter sural nerve. Because here incision is almost uh, you're not dorsal to the uh, fibula, so there is no skin issues. And also, the only thing is if you tighten too much, the patient can go for a stiff ankle. That is also another important point, especially when you do an open procedure. Or if a patient who are undergoes with the internal bracing, in this case, I have not used internal bracing I mean, I, because my cases are uh, not very high in number, but people use a lot of uh, no internal brace if the tissues are weak, then in that case, they can go for a stiff ankle. But generally, in do an open brostrum good procedure, uh, they are all uh, very good. You don't have any complications if they if are not too much uh, ever the ankle when you do a repair. Right. So, Dr. Anoop has a question. Uh, Dr. Sandrajan, wonderful video demonstration. Uh, I have a query that what is the length of the remnant by which you can actually repair? Because the chronicity with the increasing chronicity, the remnant becomes quite friable and maybe small. So, I mean, is there any guide per of which you can decide that this much probably you will be able to do and uh, you don't any, uh, require any other reinforcement procedure actually? 
uh, yes sir that is an excellent question because you know that the it's like any any ligament no any chronicity naturally leads to go for a very poor quality tissue unfortunately this cannot be gauged by any mri finding um, because sometimes when you say that lax ankle sometimes itfl might be completely torn the mri cannot have a 100% sensitivity because sensitivity is low of 56% in atfl so always we have to counsel the patient that we have to go and see inside if the tissue is very good then we can do a direct repair sometimes the tissue quality is in moderate sometimes you can do a, a internal bracing you can add on that so i think we have to be ready for both repair with the internal bracing too but in the same patients have any pre operative issues i mean other risk factors like which already we talked about like a generalized ligament laxity or the previous atfl failure then these patients we can counsel for a reconstruction because that can be done pre operatively but as you said intraoperatively it's i mean pre operatively is very difficult to gauge the uh, quality of the tissues it is very difficult dr rajesh has a question yes rajesh on the very good present uh, video uh, i would like to ask how many times did you uh, uh, have to repair cfl or did you go and repair cfl as i said my cases numbers are very low so far i have not done any cfl repair because my numbers is very very low i mean as i said and i believe you also do arthroscopic uh, atfl no i i have not done uh, arthroscopic repair i am looking for cases but as i said arthroscopic repair again the tissue quality has to be very good as very you got yes yes, yes yes you are at least open procedure we can add uh, inferior extensor retinaculum but of course people does now add uh, inferior extensor retinaculum arthroscopically too um yes. but i think but pay, I, i'm not a surgeon getting more cases in ankle instability that is a gau has joined gau probably can could uh, put in that yeah yeah gau i mean gau and we were discussing <laughs> only last week yeah. it, is, it is so a wonderful that, wonderful thing that dr gau has joined our good friend from singapore so we we would be really grateful for your experience with bostrom yes gau hi good evening to everyone in uh, india worldwide so no that was an excellent talk i learned a lot watching that video <laughs> so i think, uh, I think uh, rajesh question is very uh, it's very interesting i don't think we have the answer to that really um in my practice um i rarely also do the cfl um the ones that i do a cfl on are usually the ones who have very true objective gross uh, subtalar instability um so they usually have a tailor tilt uh, sign that's positive um and they definitely have an extra give in terms of subtalar jog uh, on the affected side compared to the opposite side um the the question i was going to ask you uh, sundar is do you think the uh, footprint of where you put the suture anchor do you think it makes a difference yeah i i mean if, if, if you are uh, i think that if you are having a enough space for the put the two anchors i think that should be an ideal to do a two anchors in the whole of the inferior footprint area i think that is very very i think as you said it is very important um, but in this case i had used only single loaded double i mean single anchor with the double loaded anchor uh, because i know that i'm going to add the uh, good procedure also so i have not yes. used two anchors i think the footprint is very very important uh, definitely and another uh, thing is about the cfl repair I really I'm, i i even I, i whatever the cases numbers are as i said and my numbers are low but all the other other case, all the cases i have not seen any cfl tear yeah when you talk to the one nick he is saying when it, whenever he always he does uh, take the both is a sleeve both uh, atfl and cfl he take this a full full sleeve and that making a drill hole and what you saw in the like a colson technique you reattach it so i don't know maybe in their part if they get more cfl tears but in ours i mean i don't know our our side i have not seen much cfl tears yeah i think uh, initially when uh, when i started doing the open bostrom uh, and i was concerned about cfl um i used to do them a lot more but as i started doing the arthro bostrom and and ignoring the cfl and i realized that actually the results uh, are very comparable and in fact the arthroscopy is faster to do because you do it at the arthroscopic setting i realized actually the cfl probably doesn't make a huge difference um and uh, so i've only i've only uh, chosen my patients more carefully to decide who needs cfl and who doesn't yeah i think so if you have a patient with uh, generalized laxity 
would you do something extra for these patients other than this yeah that's i think that's a great question <laughs> i think the drug literature supports and us i mean maybe the reconstruction can be a better option than the direct repair especially when i have a generalized ligament laxity uh, what go what your experience on generalized ligament laxity yeah i think uh, yeah i think the generalized uh, laxity are the ones that you send to every other person you can think of <laughs> before you uh, before you eventually do an operation uh physiotherapist osteopath uh you know whoever not pediatrics um i tend to use the suture tape uh more freely if i'm doing a uh, generalized ligament or someone with a higher beaten score um if somebody has had a revision uh, or is having a revision ligament recon i would use the suture tape uh if the patient is has got a subtle cavus foot or even a cavus foot um and i wasn't doing a uh, lateralizing calcaneal osteotomy i would use a suture tape uh and if the patient has a uh, uh, a rather weak peroneal or a, a tip post overdrive uh i would also use a suture tape uh but i think the ligament laxity one is the is the most difficult one and that one i would freely use a suture tape and i just think it's just belt and braces so got no signs to back it up and uh, go yes you are doing more numbers so i want to ask i mean uh, what is your indication for your reconstructions i mean anatomical reconstructions yeah i think um i think that's a very good question um i i can't really answer that question actually because i just generally find that uh, exactly like you say sundar i would go in with the idea of doing a conventional bostrom gold uh, i would always have the suture tape as a standby uh, and if i do not have any remnant ligament uh or oh, i think that there is remnant ligand but when i put the suture through it just tears apart uh i would then fall back on the suture tape um i used to do uh peroneal or uh, autograft slings and uh, even the achilles but i just think that with a suture tape it just takes too much mobility from the donor side so i don't do that anymore that's a good answer so another question is uh yeah but there are questions from dr rajiv and dr anup Dr. Rajiv and Dr. Noob, please. Yeah. So, Sundar, excellent video demonstration. So, when you have this, you are double breasting this slab. So, how often do you tie into osteostasis with fibular fibular periosteum also? Do you need to tie up with the fibular periosteum also? Because when you are elevating it, you are elevating with the periosteum with the remaining uh, HFL too. So, both basically you are including in that flap. So basically, you don't need to separately take the worry about the periosteum. Where is it? You don't need to search for that. So you are taking the distal fibers of the ATFL along with the periosteum, and you shall have it as a flap. Do you need to take a bite intraosseous bite also? No, no, I don't. I don't think so. Suppose if the yes, he said. I mean, if the tissue quality is very poor, when you do a direct repair, maybe you can make a drill hole. Uh, as you said, you can do a repair. So that is the technique. Already, many people are doing that. That is a good osseous repair. You can get it. If the quality of the tissue is good, then that to that repair, and you can add this uh, uh, good procedure. Right, so, Doctor, so yeah. uh, Doctor Sundarajan, when you talked about that, uh, you had less number of cases for these repairs. That brings me a question to all the faculties: that is it the number of cases which comes to you are less, or is it difficult to convince these patient with a with telling the prognosis that they don't get agree to get repairs done easily? I mean, do you all guys face such kind of problem, or is it typical with me when I talk about these repairs with the ankle injury? I know it is not a problem; it's a good problem only. You, <laughs> that means. But I can tell you that in India, especially in, with our patients, sometimes you really have to go to extra length to convince them. The best uh, method would be to have a pool of your satisfied patients, have a pool of your videos results. You need to show them because. the results are made as very gratifying so if a patient in the goes the surgery he really is a very a grateful person so i think at a little extra effort in convincing is worth it there are two aspects of that one a is then now people will come for the you know you are not doing a repair on the first time so many people are good with the conservative management they go on very well so they are rehabilitated very well then they don't get recurrent instability or few patients who get recurrent instability then you do a even do a rehabilitation then if they come back with the recurrent instability then you suggest surgery then they may avoid that activity they i know our uh, in india they may skip that sport and they do their i mean other part they do a running or jogging so that is not going to affect your ankle uh, stability so these two factors may not uh, may, may bring down the cases for our chronic ankle instability 
my opinion that's true that i think i i second with sundar one is uh, most of the ankle sprain as as literature would have it 80 to 82 percentage of the ankle sprains are managed conservatively even if they are sports persons and uh, uh, so only that falls to only 18 percent who goes on to have a recurrent instability now the problem is 18 percent is a western literature we in india do not have so much of sports oriented people we do have the youngsters coming in but if you if you have if you look at a youngster who's pro pro into sports his parents would come say nothing doing abhi bas baitho i mean it is enough Maybe so the, so that is how it is so the numbers come down but believe me broster gold is a very satisfying surgery very good results with uh, uh, those uh, having problems and it is not that it is a complicated or or a it is a result oriented surgery and probably arthro uh, is uh, more uh, helpful but uh, even open is a very satisfying surgery and patients do good our numbers are different because of our you know, socio economic uh, this thing social background thank you when do you allow them to return back to sports under after yes, i only said at least 4 to 5 months minimum as i said and like an arthroscopy uh, not like not like knee or ankle i mean uh, so shoulder ankle all the most of our cases will be maybe like arthroscopic said ankle arthrodesis or subtalar arthrodesis rarely posterior impingement anterior impingement so we don't get a uh, fhl uh, no fhl issues or we don't get much ankle instability because we don't have a much sports persons which having these problems or ballet dancers we don't have so that's why our ankle arthroscopy in the like a tendons and these kind of uh, surgeries are bit less compared to the western right so that was a wonderful uh, presentation on uh, brostrums now moving on we have our third presenter none other than dr balinder rana sir the past president of ifas so welcome sir uh, and uh, we can have your presentation now thank you thank you shantnu and thank you rajiv anup uh mahendra and especially shantu shantanu for giving me the opportunity to be here so you, can you see my screen yes, yes sir okay so we were just showing a couple of cases one of acute lis franks and the other of chronic neglected uh lis franks uh, fracture dislocation if we have this kind of an extra presentation um uh, this is one of our physiotherapists which we which we saw about now about 3 years ago i believe you can see that gap between the bases of the first and the second metatarsals with a small fleck of bone there now generally in a general orthopedic surgery uh, center probably this would be treated conservatively and when we advised surgery to this physiotherapist who was working for us in our own hospital he ran away for about 2 weeks so he did not believe that he needed surgery he went around consulted a few people everybody advised isme kuch nahi hai there is nothing in this and you can just apply a plaster so there was a plantar ecchymosis which persisted for about 2 weeks he didn't come to work and then eventually when he, the pain did not subside then he eventually got the better thoughts and came to us for surgery so whenever you have a plantar ecchymosis and a small fleck between the bases of the first and the and the first and the second metatarsals we must suspect lis franks and that gap means that it is an unstable injury it's not only this it is quite possible that the injury has started here and gone back gone laterally and involved the bases of the second and the second and the third metatarsal so this could be unstable on the lateral side and even on the medial side we don't know that unless we stress it and then we see it and that is the x-ray uh, sorry the ct scan you can see the amount of comminution that you see in the area of the first and second metatarsals and the cuneiform so those specks of bones on the plantar side are sure signs that there is a ligamentous disruption there and this is a grossly unstable injury again the flex sign is not to be missed it could be so obvious here this is not the same case that we were discussing about but you can have major injuries uh this is subtle injury but you could have much major much more major injuries and then i always say that if you have a lis franks you try to classify them then the anc classification works well and i say that it is an absolutely nobody cares 
you don't have to classify these injuries basically what you have to do but very important before you take these patients to to surgery on your radiology try and assess and identify which joints are involved because it's it's like a bullet injury which enters at one joint and depending on the velocity of injury it can involve one joint two joint three joint four five all five can go and it can be still be a closed injury so we don't know what was the intensity of injury so try and identify the joints which are involved and which have to be fixed before you go into surgery even then you may have to go assess the stability of the other joints once you have fixed the obviously unstable joints on the injury also you have to identify that is there a fracture which is affecting the joints or it's a purely ligamentous injury and is it reconstructible another important question if it is a ligamentous injury if there are if there are major fractures which are fixable then fine you can go and open induction and internal fixation if it is not reconstructible then possibly a primary orthodesis is a good option there is no role of conservative treatment in any lis frank injury which is demonstrated on an x ray or radiology there is no role the only role of conservative treatment would be a completely stable injury which is suspected and then on stressing it is completely stable when there is those are those are uncommon injuries so commonly the lis franks are operative injuries so or if is a gold standard and we follow the principle of anatomic and rigid fixation of the first second and third tnt joints there is a debate between between primary fixation fixation or primary fusion in in many of these injuries now but we won't go into the details of that but still the gold standard is rigid fixation of the medial three joints and non rigid fixation of the lateral two joints this is not the way if we if we operate them and fix them the kwards is not the implant to use it is rigid fixation of the medial three ray either with screws or with plates and non rigid fixation on the lateral two rays and lis franks we will come to that the direction of the lis franks too when you do an open duction and tunnel fixation is also a point of debate either way the lis franks screw is from the base of the second metatarsal to the medial cuneiform or in the opposite direction and the first direction has been shown to be that is from the base of the second metatarsal to the medial cuneiform has been shown to be a better screw from the point of view of insertion as well as from the point of view of getting a good fixation so we'll come to that case again so this was our physiotherapist now on the on the ot table finally consented to the surgery so the incision will depend on how many rays you are fixing so that is why it is important to identify if possible how many rays are unstable and where are the fractures involving if you are fixing only medial three rays then one incision on the second metatarsal is enough and if you have to do an open reduction of more rays on lateral also then two incisions one on the medial side on the first web space and the other on the fourth metatarsal on the lateral side so we'll go through this can you see my video i hope it's not can you see oh, yeah yes sir yes sir it's perfect it's perfect very nice that's an incision on the first web space and you identify the tendon of the extensor hallux is hallux is brevis there which has been retracted and expose the the first and the second tmt joint the superiorostal dissection there in the first web space we have to identify the neurovascular bundle and try and protect it so that is the injury which has been exposed now and this is the amount of instability that you see although we have exposed it on the dorsal side if the plantar ligaments are intact we will not be able to move these joints when we stress them but here you can see how much movement is there Uh, in this unstable lis frank so that is our physiotherapist and then we did first the lis frank screw fixation so a tenaculum is applied from the base of the second metatarsal to the medial cuneiform in the direction in which the lis frank screw is put so that is the first keystone to be reduced when we are doing an open duction and internal fixation and then we put a lis frank screw that is the first step in majority of the situation and the direction of this screw is from the base of the second metatarsal in my hands towards the medial cuneiform and once we have done that screw fixation the stability has been achieved to a major extent and then we can do depending on the other areas involved plate fixation bridging plate fixation for the other joints so this is a lis frank screw and then we we saw that the medial ray was pretty unstable 
So we went on and did a cross plating, that is a X plate with one screw in each corner of that unstable complex. The base of the first metatarsal, the medial cuneiform, the base of the second metatarsal and the middle cuneiform. That's, that's a, an AO plate, which can be uh, fixed to the bone using beaded wires and it stabilizes the blade and then one locking screw in each corner um, of that unstable complex to hold the injury together. Once we did this, we found, you, we assessed the third TMD and to our surprise, we found the third TMD was also unstable. So we went on and did a plate fixation of the third uh, torso metatarsal joint also in this patient. So these are the four screws in the four corners. These are locking variable angles going into different directions. And once we have fixed that, then you, we need to assess the other joints. So we were not expecting to find instability of the third TMT, but when we went in, we did see a third TMT. So that is the third TMT, see? That is the third TMT instability. And then we put a plate on the third TMT also. So that is how we fix this. This is, and generally, if you have to do a lateral also, then you have to do a separate incision and only a KY fixation after, after open reduction of the, of the lateral rays. So I hope we see the X-rays in the same video, post-op X-rays. So these are the post-op X-rays. This is on the table, obviously, third TMT plate, Lisprank screw and a bridge plate across that unstable complex there. So this guy has not got his implant removed because this was not a fusion. This was an open induction. Three years down the line, he has not broken it. He has a bit of pain when he struggles a lot with a lot of walking, then only otherwise he is doing, he's doing fairly well. Now, that was an acute fixation. We quickly come around to the second case, which is a 29-year-old Delhi policeman who came to us with about six months down the line, but with these x-rays. So these were the x-rays on the day of injury. This is not the way he presented to us, but these were his x-rays on the day of injury, and it is obvious it is an instability of all the joints there. You can see the first is gone, second is gone, third is subluxated, and it looks like the fourth and the fifth are also a bit unstable. And somewhere in Delhi, this was the way it was fixed on the day of injury. So neither the joints are reduced, nor the fixation is proper. A couple of KYs there, so, and that is what you feel when you see that kind of case. And we call it an iatrogenic complication and God-made disaster, something like this. So it's a God-made disaster, but you can't do anything about it. And that is how you feel when you have that kind of fixation and you're going into fix this kind of situation that these are difficult. But then this was an X-ray at six months. Same patient, six months when he presented to us, unable to walk, you see the first TMT is unstable. The second is unstable. The third is definitely unstable. Maybe the fourth and fifth has been, have been stabilized by the K-wire, whatever was done, they were put back and they did not look. He was not having pain in the lateral side, but the medial three was very painful and standing X-rays showed arch collapse on the lower bottom. On the lower X-ray, you see the subluxated TMT there. The first TMT, you can see the overhanging first base, base of the first metatarsal and collapse at the arch at this area the TMT area. These are is uh, pre-op clinical pictures on the right side. We can see complete loss, abduction of the foot there on that side and valgus posture of the right side and pronation of the forefoot. So then we exposed because we decided we are not going to do the lateral, anything on the lateral photos, one midline incision centered on, on the second metatarsal. So some continuous uh, of nerves and veins trying to preserve them. That is the tendon of the extensor hallucis brevis. Give an incision on the fascia of that tendon exposing the, the tendon. This is also a step in the acute fixation. We retract the extensor hallucis brevis on, on either side to enter the joints, the first, the second, and the third TMD through one single incision. And many a times when you're doing a chronic case, you just cannot see the joints properly. So you have to remove the overlying osteophyte sometimes and bridging bone to, dis to see the joints properly. And we cannot do a fusion unless we have proper instrumentation. We have to distract these joints. So this is a hinterman's distractor with a wire at the base of the first metatarsal and one wire at the, at the medial cuneiform. And then once you have fixed these wires and using the distractor and distract it, then you see 
the amount of uh, joint that you can see. And unless we do that distraction, we just cannot do a proper job and the cartilage will not be removed appropriately. After the removal of cartilage, subchondral bone preparation is done with the help of drills. And once the, come going back again, you see the subchondral preparation with drilling is very important. And once we have done that, we collapse it, remove the retractor and go on to the second joint. So this is a second TMT. Now again, the same distractor has been applied on the second TMT. And when we distract it, the similar situation, we will see the, the articular surface will be seen, the joint will be visualized using thin blade osteotomes or small curates. We denuded the joint, subchondral bone drilling, and then the same step as in the acute phase. A Lisfranc's clamp, tenaculum from the base of the second to the medial cuneiform, and then again a Lisfranc's screw first to get the, the rays aligned well. That is a keystone where we generally start. You see this first is so much subluxated. Now that is a manual reduction of the first. And then after the list Frank screw, provisional stabilization with a wire. And then finally, three plates again, first, second, and the third TMTs were, were, uh, were fixed. And then these are the intraoperative uh, pictures after finishing the surgery. And these are his post-op images. That's about three months, four months down the line and united. And that is his video. I hope you can see that of his, of his walking. He was not able to put weight before the surgery because of the amount of uh, pain he had. And he had a good restoration of his arches. So I'll stop here. I think I've shown um, the technique uh, in, a, in a whatever way that was possible. And any questions, you're welcome. Yeah, Balvinder, the fantastic, yeah. uh, fantastic videos. Uh, there's one thing uh, I wanted to ask you. When you're exposing, do you specifically look out for any intercuniform instability and yes. how do you check it? Yes, yes, that's important. So intercuniform instability is, is, is important, obviously, and the way to check is, is obviously to stress it. When you're exposed from the dorsal side and you stress the cuneiforms, you can see in the first case, when I was stressing the, uh, the first TMT by abduction, you could see the intercuniform was also opening. And obviously, if, the, if you find that unstable and you fix that in terms of fixing the TMT joints, you may get a stability, but in many situations, you have to put an intercuniform fixation separately after preparing the intercuniform yeah. joint. Yeah, because the point I'm trying to make is that if you just look at the X-ray and treat only those joints, you might miss a lot of other injuries associated with that. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah, that's, that's the right point. I agree to that, yeah. Right, sir. So that was really a wonderful presentation, sir. So certain points that you have made are really uh, pertinent. One is the Lisfranc injury is a wide spectrum of injury. It could be something very innocuous with just a ligamentous injury. Or it could be a very uh, apparent and very disfigured kind of look would be there when all the five rays are disturbed. Right. Yeah. So uh, as far as the video techniques are concerned, that uh, surgical techniques are concerned, there are certain uh, things which are coming up recently. Because earlier we used to use only screws. Now the plates are coming. With the view that we must not uh, really uh, violate the articular cartilage. Although there are very, there is very few, there is very less amount of movement in those joints uh, in the first, second and third rays. But still, the concept of using the plate is coming up rather than the screws. I'm not talking about the list frank screw. That is to be there. But what is your take on that, sir? So people who are still using the screws and not using the plate, are they justified in doing that or everybody should move on to plates only? Well, there is, uh, that's a very good question. I think there is still an open debate on screws versus plates and there are ifs and buts of both the situations. But we all know that we have articular surfaces of these joints are pretty small. I mean, thinking logically, you think about a small area of uh, the joint articulating and once we are drilling uh, with a 2.5 millimeter drill bit and putting a 3.5 millimeter uh, cortex screw through that articular surface. Um, I mean, it is unlikely that the joint will function normally when we remove the implants and we don't expect them to function normally, I believe, when we do the internal fixation. Otherwise, where else in body would you put a joint spanning fixation and remove it at the end of six months, eight months, and then expect the joints to be, behave normally? We, we don't expect them, I believe, that they become fibrous ankylos or something like that. But still, 
and thinking about rationally destroying the articular surface with a drill and cortex, possibly the bridging plates are better, but the soft tissue complications are a bit more with plate, but we are using good quality plates, smaller, small profile plates. I believe we should, we should prefer plates over screws uh, more, I think. And there is also a, another debate about the primary fusion versus fixation, which is, which is a big, big issue going on these days. Absolutely. The third one is, uh, the second question is, uh, the number of incision, many of the Indian feet, especially ladies, they have a smaller feet. And if they have all the five rays disturbed, would you always use a double incision or you might consider using a single long incision because when you use double incision, it's a, in a smaller size foot. Then the, the bridge of skin between those two incision are very small. Sometimes the chance of dehiscence or wound complication is there. So are you very rigid about having do two incision when you have to fix the five uh, columns or you can also think of putting one long midline incision, longitudinal incision, or you ever use a transfer incision as well? Well, I've never used a transverse one, but I know there are some reports, some authors have done that, but I've never used a transverse incision. But yes, I have done a couple of times a single midline incision for more than three joint uh, fixation and fusion. And in, in cases where there was a bit of swelling and I had to go in early for some reasons. So I did use a single midline incision where I was a bit afraid of getting a soft tissue compromise. But we can actually plan our incisions around the joints in a way that the bridge is um, not a narrow bridge. So if you're doing a dual incision, then prefer to keep the medial incision a bit more medial than the usual described incision in the texts. So what we describe is in the along the medial side of the second metatarsal. So you can actually do a more medial incision uh, on the first ray itself. And those two you can address through this medial incision and the fourth on the fourth ray. So you can actually tweak the incision a bit from what is described and still keep the bridge a bit more. But, you, but a single midline incision is definitely an option. It, it's not a big no, no, no. So in cases where there is still a bit of swelling and you have to go in early, I would prefer to do a midline single approach, long incision. I just have one last question from my side. And that question is, uh, in a case where you have done just the correct fixation and that also going on to having complication of uh, osteoarthritis, how many such cases you had, if at all you had? I don't ask me because people don't like when I say I, I, I find fusion now. I'm, I moved on to fusions, primary fusions, even with small injuries. Even with small injuries. I, I, I used to do fixations more often. I think over the last couple of years, I have tried to move on to fusions because these patients are never pain-free when you fix them. A uh, couple of my patients gave me a very bad time with anatomic reductions of the joints, looking very nice on the x-ray on the x-ray with primary fixation, but they come back, they have pain, they're not happy. And when if you remove, remove the implants, they're always in pain. Don't remove the implants, some of them are happy. So I don't know why, but so I have moved on to more of primary fusions in majority of cases, even with small, low energy fractures. Yeah, Rajiv. Yeah. I think in uh, pure ligamentous injury, primary fusion is the only option. I think it's a, it's a better option and nowadays, the people are moving towards more fuse and primary orthodosis versus osteosynthesis for ligamentous injury. So what is your no. say on that? No, I agree to that. Ligamentous injury, as well as low energy non-ligamentous fractures, also where there is an intra-articular fracture of the first and the second metatarsals, or maybe the third, or with a flex sign also should be considered as a ligamentous injury only. And I am beginning to believe, although there is there is some support in the literature, it's not entirely non unscientific. There is some support in the literature now that partial primary orthrodesis of the medial rays, even in low energy fractures, gives you a better functional outcome and lesser repeat surgeries. How often do you, uh, how long you keep the medial arch support? Because there's a controversy. So how, how long yeah. do you should continue with this medial arch support? So I, I typically do it for at least a year after the surgery, at least a year. People re say about six months, but I recommend at least a year after the surgery and our support should be used. So is it the arch support or you use, use a carbon fiber uh, sort of a rigid shank on the shoe? 
I don't use a rigid rigid shank on the shoes. I I give a hard based definitely, but a padded support. I'm grateful that my good friend Go has unmasked himself finally, and <laughs> and uh, some uh, comments from you as well, Dr. Go. Oh. Yeah, it'll be good to hear his opinion on prime diffusion, maybe. <laughs> no, what no. Do you think about it. Uh, I think I think like you said, uh, Balvinda, the the or the jury is still out, uh, yeah. and so we still need a large number. Uh, pros at least uh, comparative prospective studies, uh, if not a randomized controlled trial to answer that question. Um, I think the thing that's thrown the, uh, the spanner in the works is the dynamic fixation. Um, and there are more and more individuals now who are fixing things dynamically. Uh, and that is probably a halfway house in compromise between uh, a screw fixation uh, and something more rigid like a plate. Um, my argument for using the tightrope is that I don't have to go back in and take the screw out. Uh, and uh, the plate, I find, uh, often requires a plate fixation removal. Um, so for, for very subtle instabilities, I tend to use the tightrope uh, between the middle cuneiform, uh, sorry, the medial cuneiform and the base of second. Uh, and I use a fixation screw between the medial cuneiform and the middle cuneiform. Uh, I only use the plate when there is a dorsal sag. Uh, so on the lateral view, if the base of first is dorsally subluxed, then I would use a plate. Uh, but my, my argument is based on the fact that plate removals are relatively common. So I prefer not to use plate for that reason. Yeah, right. but is there, is there enough um, evidence today to, to, to justify the uh, dynamic fixation with the tightrope? Uh, is the literature still yeah, I think I think your um, I, I think support you know the answer uh, to the question. Your experience. What is your experience? Yeah, I think the answer to the question there is 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 going to be no. But my argument is is quite the converse. My argument is there isn't any evidence that it doesn't work. Uh, and my argument with the tight rope is that of course a dynamic, it's physiological, and I don't need to remove it. So all I need is a is a device that actually draws the two ends of the bones together to reconstitute the list frank base. And I think the tight rope does that well. Whether it actually, and I don't seem to find any sagging uh, at six weeks, at three months and six months. Uh, and, and with the screw, I think the fixation is a bit too rigid. Uh, and whilst it looks great on the x-ray, the patients have pain, like you say. And I think that's because the fixation becomes a bit too rigid. And we, even when we take the screws out, like you say exactly, they tend to get a semi-fibrosed uh, first, second TMT complex, and they don't like that either. So I find that tight rope, a bit like the syndesmosis, is a nice compromise. But well, good. It will be good to see uh, some uh, data in the future. Yeah, it'll be good. Yeah, I believe that I have thought about it, and such the literature. There was a patient who asked me about it. it was quite educated, but I didn't have the courage to go ahead and do it. But I think if you have been doing. Uh, some people I know are doing so. If, if you have some good results, then maybe we can be encouraged to mm. take up tight ropes more often. Well, my apprehension, my apprehension on on tight rope is, you, how is it rotationally stable? You are just compressing it, while your Lisfranc joint is, you know, it is the dorsiflexion. I mean, the up and down movements. So how stable? Would a tight rope give? How stable? How much of a stability will a tight rope give in a rot as as far as a rotational stability is concerned? Mm. You are just compressing it like a screw, but screw is rigid, so it does not allow the rotation. Mm. While how much does the tight rope give? I mean, that is the apprehension which I yeah. felt. So my uh, my rationale for that is um, at the between the base of the second and the middle cuneiform. Uh, most of the plane or the most of the planes of instability is going to be dorsal plantar because medial and lateral stability is going to be restored by an intact first and an intact third. Rotationally, in, inherently, the metatarsals are not going to be rotationally unstable because they are splintered on either side by soft tissue structures. And unless you so have... Dorsal plantar, how would you yeah. explain? Yeah, with dorsal, so, with, so with dorsal plantar, if the tight rope is slightly oblique, and if it drives from the medial cuneiform going up to the base of the second, 
uh, from a slightly plantar direction to a dorsal direction, then that acts as a strut or like a hammock to prevent the second metatarsal from sagging down. That is the direction of Liss Frank ligament. That's a lot, yeah. Right. You may make it. Yeah. So, Gao, I principally agree uh, with your concept of using the tight rope. Perhaps it's good in acute injury because if you look at the arch, so it's in dynamic structure actually arch. But vis-a-vis, -vis, if you look at the chronic injury, there are two components to the injury. Basically, one, we are talking about the dynamicity of your arch. And then there are the joint cartilage, which has already damaged because it was a chronic injury. So, even in the chronic injury, would you go for the same procedure or would you go for then arthrodesis and fix it by the plate? Or maybe arthrodesis, are you trying with the tight rope? No, I would never do a chronic case with a tight rope. Yeah. Because I think uh, the tight rope is a, a good device in the acute setting. And even in the acute setting, I would say it's within the first two to four weeks. Beyond four weeks, uh, I think it gets a little bit tricky. Um, and I think there is enough scarring in there that the tight rope may not be able to restore uh, the same degree of stability. So, and uh, I think there's more and more a shift towards doing a fusion. So I think if you're, if you're catching someone beyond six or maybe even eight weeks, uh, I would have a lower threshold to go straight for a fusion. All right, thank you. Dr. Baldinger. So, yeah. uh, uh, discussion, any further question on that one topic one. of the- Yeah, one question. last question. Sandhu, yeah, yeah. yeah, Dr. Baldinger, uh, there is another controversy now People are talking more about the plantar plate because of better contour of the plantar bone. It's on the tensile surface and less irritation to the soft tissue. So what is your say on putting a plantar plates rather than a dorsal medial plates? In Liz Frank's, uh, no, I, I don't remember any literature and I have never used a plantar plate in a Liz Frank's injury. Um, obviously, the, the dislocations are always dorsal because the plantar ligaments are are stronger and the dorsals are weaker, so it always dislocates dorsally. So by biomechanically also, it has to be a dorsal plate. Well, in Lisfra and in, in charcoats, possibly, I mean, I've used some plantar plates in the charcoats on the medial side because that's a different ball game altogether. But in acute Lisfranks, uh, I only use dorsal plates. Yeah. Right. So right, moving on. Uh, allow me to welcome the past. Secretary of Indian Foot and Ankle Society, past president of Indian Foot and Ankle Society, a great humanitarian, a great philanthropist, my friend, philosopher, and guy, none other than Dr. Sampa Dumre Patil from Pune. We welcome you, sir, and we are glad to have you here. You have just finished one webinar and you have joined us. We are really grateful to you. We are, you. We are not giving you. So Thank we are just you. waiting for a, a just a beautiful presentation from you, sir. Sure, sir. Sorry for joining late. Uh, I will uh, start with the video on uh, uh, the sinus tarsi uh, approach and technique for uh, the uh, fracture calcaneum. So, is it uh, visible now? Yes, sir. It is. Please go so, ahead. Yeah. Uh, I'm planning the sinus tarsi incision. Tip of uh, you like can't see full screen, not full screen. Video is not open. Video is not open yet. Yeah, video has been open. Please show it the desktop. Uh, okay, I let me. Are you able to see now, sir? Uh, not, yet. not yet, Sambal. Okay, just give me a second. No problem. If it is in the PowerPoint, you can open the PowerPoint and you can play the video. I will, I will open the PowerPoint. That is easy. Yeah. Or you open the video, then go to share screen, then click on that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's that should be. Just give me one second, sir. No problem, it's okay. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, I should open the uh, video and again share the screen. No? Yes. Open the uh, video, then make it pause, then share the screen, then you can play. You have to open the video and keep it in the desktop, then share it. It will come. Yes, I done it now. Yeah. Is it seen? Yes. No, yes, yes. Oh, sorry for the delay. So um, uh, we are uh, seeing the sinus tarsi approach in this particular patient where there is a, a fracture uh, of the uh, calcaneum. The posterior facet is absolutely 90 degree down. And uh, uh, this is how we proceed. Uh, we do evaluate with um, X-ray. Um, and uh, lateral position is given. Um, tip of lateral malleolus to the sinus, uh, to the fourth metatarsal base. This is the incision. Uh, unlike the lateral extensor approach, we may not have to wait for 10, 12 days, little early, but of course soft tissues you evaluate, um, uh, they are fine and little early you can go ahead. Uh, we take the incision uh, and uh, sharp dissection, but layer by layer dissection is done. Uh, here you should go slow just to see, just to protect peroneal tendons. Use a bump on, under the medial malleolus and invert it. This is to make the calcaneofibular ligament prominent. And look at this. This is a significant big calcaneofibular ligament. Unless you cut it, you will not be able to see the joint or posterior facet. So protect peroneal tendons and uh, uh, cut the uh, calcaneofibular ligament. Once you cut it, you are in the joint and then you will be able to see posterior facet of talus, but uh, the adjoining calcaneum uh, facet is down. So I'm inserting this osteotome between lateral wall and below the facet and look at this. This is the key point. Elevate it and um, match it to the talus Posterior facet. Look at this. That's it. So this is how you can match the posterior facet of calcaneum to the posterior facet of talus, and this is uh, going to be uh, the fixation, which is for the uh, sustentaculum screw. The direction is important. It's from lateral to medial, and uh, uh, it is uh, it little um, posterior to anterior and it is little from down to up. So lateral to medial, posterior to anterior, and little down to up. It should aim towards the sustentaculum talus. And like we do in pelvis, that we feel the opposite cortex. You feel the opposite cortex because it is strong and don't exit because of the neurovascular structures you are very near. On the wire, we are drilling for the 4 mm CC screw and this screw is going to be important. Of course, before this, we have already transfixed it, uh, transfixed the facet through this wire from the plantar aspect. And um, you can use these small plates as well if you wish uh, after inserting that screw. These are 2 mm or 2.5 mm plates, which can be used to fix anterior um, body fragments and the posterior tuberosity fragments, if they are there, and they'll be fixed with uh, locking screws. These are 2.5 locking plates. Uh, if needed, you can use them, or uh, this is how this particular fracture was fixed, because this was the uh, fracture cleavage here. To uh, trick to see the axial view and broadens view, this is broadens view. And the axial view use bandage, not to uh, irradiate your hands. So uh, most of the fractures can be uh, done through sinus tarsi approach. And I particularly uh, use it to um, uh, almost uh, lateral extensile approach I'm not taken for a few years now. Almost all the fractures can be done through uh, sinus tarsi approach. Thank you so much.
Thank you, sir. That was really a wonderful thing. As you rightly said, the most important thing is the direction of the screw, which fixes the uh, constant fragment from lateral to medial, from uh, posterior to anterior, and from uh, down to a little up. That's a wonderful thing. One thing is that. And uh, my question is, from your experience, how would you say, how long is the learning curve from the lateral extensile approach moving on to sinus tarsi approach? Approximately how many cases you did with lateral extensile and then moved on to the sinus tarsi approach, sir? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you have to have exposure, complete exposure of open uh, cases first to move on to this, but it's not difficult. I mean, a uh, few cases, maybe um, eight, 10 cases of open fractures, and um, then you get used to it. Of course, you have to first plan on CT scan, understand the basic um, uh, fragments, where they are there. But sinus tarsi approach, I think uh, uh, it's very uh, useful approach because rest alignment, that is axial alignment, um, height, width can be maintained by non-invasive approach. And what you have to see is posterior facet can be seen through sinus tarsi. Wonderful, sir. Another question I have, and many people ask me, with the lateral extensile approach, sometimes you have to osteotomize out the lateral wall. Because unless you remove the lateral wall of the calcaneus, you are not able to visualize the depressed fragment. So here, since the incision is small, and are you able really to prize out the lateral wall so as to see the depressed fragment? Yeah, that's a good question because uh, CT scan is helpful. You have to see first, where is the posterior facet line? If this is calcinum, my thumb is lateral wall. If my facet is over here, here, or here, what I do is I insert in this cleavage a, a humans or a, a forearm spike. First, it should be this way, go down so it is non-traumatic, reverse it, and then elevate it. So you are, going, you are going between the lateral wall and facet, go little beyond or below the posterior facet so that you give more bone with the posterior facet. Fortunately, yeah. fortunately, posterior facet is a thalamic fragment. So it has got its little more thick bone with it. So just go yeah. this way, revert it and then elevate it. So that posterior facet is up there. So you are not reflecting, you are keeping intact lateral wall, but you should go between lateral wall and posterior facet, reverse it and then elevate it. It's an excellent, excellent tip and trick, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dr. Rajiv. So, Dr. Sampat, excellent video demonstration. So, whether it is for only, because I lost my connection for a while, whether your sinus tarsi approach is only for type 2 or 3 fracture or you can do sometime you plan it in more commuted fracture also. So, in fact, uh, this can be used for all fractures. I will show you some cases where we have done it for such fractures that um, you will not uh, imagine. I mean, um, almost all fractures, because see, what you need in uh, calcarium fracture is axial alignment, maintain the height, width, and then one of the step is posterior facet. So uh, maintaining ex uh, axial alignment, height, width can be done closed. And then yeah. you can, you just to see this posterior facet, you can utilize this incision. So it's a good objective way to do it. And almost few years, at least three, four years, I have not taken lateral extension approach. So almost all fractures can be done. Yes. Yeah, Rana, sir. Hi, Sampal. Hello, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. So there are some reports which say, which claim that uh, uh, there are more chances of sural nerve injury um, with the sinus tarsi approach and the skin complications in some of the series say they are not, obviously not as problematic as in the lateral approach, but they are still there. So comparing the two, some people have claimed that the nerve is right in your in your approach, in your incision. So there has been a study which which documented the exact position of the sural nerve in some cadaveric dissection and suggested some modification of the sinus tarsi incision. So in your experience, in your cases, have you seen any any sural nerves problems postoperatively? Yeah, if you see if you see my incision, sir, I have little go little dorsally for same this thing, but um, I have not encountered that nerve uh, issue till now. But um, uh, if you go a little towards fourth uh, metatarsal base, 
I think uh, although Suralno has varied uh, uh, picture, I mean varied course, still uh, I have personally not come across any Suralno issue, and uh, I always uh, go sharp but layer by layer. So if at all you come across, I think better to isolate. But uh, uh, personally, I have no uh, issues with the Suralno. Mm. And you have not used the specially designed plates which have been designed for the sinus tarsi approach. Uh, I have. I have used sir, but they are quite costly, and I I think yeah. it is unnecessary. Unnecessary because same job will be done by even one third tubular plate. I mean, anything low profile should be good enough. And some people claim that you need to buttress the lateral wall all the time with a good calcaneus plate. Um, so that does become a problem with the sinus tarsi approach. With a big blowout on the lateral side, then some people claim that you need to buttress on the lateral surface. So how so, I how I negotiate is uh, let me uh, will you just allow me to show one case how how I do it uh, please, please, please yeah I will yeah. just show you one case where uh, what we do is uh, we uh, just uh, in, uh, I mean anchor K wires across the posterior facet through sinus tarsi so in that manner you can just uh, uh, maintain the uh, lateral wall as well. Uh, so what I do, I will just show you. See this. Yeah. Are you able to see the my screen, sir? Yes, yes, yes. So what we do is, I will just show you uh, this thing, uh, a case where um, uh, everything was gone, but uh, uh, K wires are. You see this, sir. Now this is a fracture where talus has gone between calcaneum and, uh, and where. Even uh, ankle is subluxated between two um, calcaneum fragments. Talus has gone, and unfortunately, he was 60 year diabetic. So I, I had never no courage to take lateral extensile approach. This was it. It, it went absolutely uh, uh, inside. Look at this city. The uh, calcaneum is separated. It has come. Uh, of course, here lateral wall um, is not there. I will show you how to do it. So. Uh, sinus tarsi approach, and uh, this is what I was telling that axial alignment with this wire first, medial to lateral, maintain the axial alignment. And this is the wire I'm talking about. This wire will give me intact lateral this thing. So, what is it is doing is it is maintaining axial alignment, it is maintaining height, it is maintaining width, and this is going to be anchorage in the talus. So, it is going to give me something. See this now. Something like intact lateral wall. So in that, I'm I'm going for minimally uh, 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 long plates and not the stronger plates. What uh, uh, what uh, we usually do. So this this one wire, I keep it inside for almost six weeks, so that lateral wall uh, I don't reconstruct with big plates. Okay. That's See, really nice. In in lateral this thing, I keep it for six weeks almost. Almost, I have started now treating this only with K wires or a, a single screw if it is needed. Hardly I use plates now because see, uh, this wire is going to give me good axial alignment. This wire helps me to avoid subsidence of facet. This wires as, uh, helps me to maintain the height. Uh, a wire in this way into the cuboid will help me to maintain the length as well. So, so this wire is uh, the end of it is out, and you just bury it inside the and inside the slab yes. of the car. Yes. So what I do is I start from plantar aspect. I don't start from posterior aspect. And once I show it after the surgery to the patient, what helps me is he does not walk on it. I show okay. them that the wires are out from from the plantar aspect, and uh, it does not impinge him when he's lying down. Compliance is good because. Um, uh, patient does not walk when he sees that wires are projecting from plantar aspect, and we have to just pull it out after four to six weeks on OPD basis. So, Dr. Sampath, perhaps this as an example to look for the lateral wall stability or buttressing may not be as good when you have a comminuted thin lateral wall. So, are you putting in those cases two or three wires? Two, at least two wires. At least two wires. So those wires are uh, always helping us to uh, reconstruct. Uh, I don't have a case here, but those wires are uh, helping us to reconstruct uh, the lateral wall. At least two wires and different uh, this thing. Then, if there is a combination anteriorly, then just cross over to the cuboid. 
uh, if there is a combination more in superior aspect crossover to talus because anyway we do it uh, intraoperatively so why not to keep it this that allows would mean, that yeah. would mean that you are not mobilizing them for that much period of time i generally will prefer to move the joints at least about 4 5 days down the line they move everything every support every slab and everything and start moving the ankle and subtalar joint yeah, so only, have... yeah only thing is i what i tell them is simulated weight bearing so what i do is just ask them to uh, keep on pressing at the end of bed so that is the uh, thing which uh, is avoiding the crps but this i do in only comminuted one uh, otherwise if you are happy with the screw which is there for sustentaculum it's fine in combination i will just ask them to do simulated bed so basically you use these k wires for lateral wall as a sort of raft wires for the lateral wall yeah not only lateral wall this helps me in few things sir always remember one is it maintains axial alignment because we are right there across the talus and talus is very strong bone it is just like a external fixator rod outside second thing is facet will not subside even if you put plate sometimes facet subsides this kevy doesn't allow to subside it maintains the height it maintains the width and basically compliance because patient does not walk on these wires no no i can tell you one thing sir although you flipped through this presentation of yours very quickly i could see you have done something some very innovative work there some very out of the box thinking you have done very relevant for our population with our people with very limited resources it is really wonderful thank you we are publishing this almost 4 years data now we are publishing okay. this with uh, uh, some other surgeons because this is more more possible in civil hospital very cheap method okay. only k wires wonderful that's wonderful actually so, dr sampath uh, do you release the inferior perineal retinaculum by by dissection uh, uh, in early cases not needed sir i mean with fracture it is already there so i just release that calcaneo fibular ligament release is most important unless you release it you won't see anything once you release it i don't uh, need to go to the inferior peroneal uh, retina the only issue as uh, told by palvinder sir also is that it's like a internervous drain between the peroneal and superficial peroneal sudal line so how to avoid injury to those two structures i, I uh, he he discussed that so i usually uh, don't go in early cases i will not release it uh any other question from any of the faculty any of the participants please uh so that was a really a wonderful master class in all the presentation and uh, is it time to wrap up yes i think anup anup can uh, give a vote of thanks yes yeah, yeah sure sure yeah <laughs> so thank you everybody i think it was really a learning process even for me i'm not basically a foot and ankle surgeon but yes we all do trauma uh, a lot of trauma so we do often get uh, these kind of injuries and it was a great learning process for me and uh, a great fellowship to meet all the stalwarts of foot and ankle so let me thank each and everybody on behalf of rajiv and shantanu for presenting so nicely and thank you uh, ashok for uh, doing the wonderful job for spreading the knowledge so thank, thank you everybody and thank have you. a safe stay and good night thank stay you safe. stay safe thank you thank you thank you, you satruda